Hey guys, Sean G. Phillips here. Welcome to my February 8th DVD update. Where I talk about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've gotten over the last two weeks or so. Like I always say, if you guys enjoyed these updates, definitely give this video a thumbs up. You know, like the video below. Uh, leave me comments on what you thought about the titles that I reviewed in this update. Any future titles to check out for future updates. There's a lot of really cool titles in this update. Especially some really cool horror films. Watched a lot of horror films. I was actually having, like at one point, some like terrible dreams because I watched so many horror movies. So I had to like break it up. I, there was one comedy in this. There's one horror movie in this, which I think was the scariest movie I've seen in a long time, and one of the funniest comedies I've seen in a long time. Uh, the first one that I'm going to talk about is uh, the Diamond Edition Blu-ray DVD digital copy of The Jungle Book, which to me is, you know, from Disney, which is one of one of those movies that I've watched ever since I was a kid. Always was a fan of this one. You know, everybody always remembers the song, you know, with Baloo, you know, the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Come, come on down with DVDs and Blu-rays. Cold Duder loves his Blu-rays more than li life itself. No, well, we're going we're gonna to talk, though, about The Jungle Book, which I thought... You know, Disney is always doing such an amazing job cleaning these movies up on Blu-ray. To me, it's really amazing how they can make these things look like these movies that are, you know, from the back to the 40s. I believe this one was in the 60s. I think 67, I believe. Might be totally wrong on the date. But they can make it look like they're brand new, which I really love, is that they put so much effort into cleaning these movies up, making them look pristine. You know, if you haven't seen the story of The Jungle Book, it's about uh, a kid who is left out in the middle of the jungle as a kid, you know, as a baby, and ends up raised by a, you know, a colony of panthers. And he's basically just a kid in the jungle, and there's a tiger that is coming back to the jungle who's been away for years, who, you know, he finds out about him living out there with the panthers and, you know, with all the animals, and it basically says that he's going to eat him and kill him, you know, if he doesn't leave. And it's the story of him with the panther in character, you know, and kind of his adventure of, you know, kind of them trying to make him want to live, you know, with humans. And, you know, he meets Baloo the bear along the way. The um, cool orangutan, you know, sings, I want to walk like you, boo, boo, boo. And I don't know, I, to me, I, just, I love the songs of this movie. Uh, but that's pretty much what it is, is the adventure. And then the snake that's after him along the way, it's always trying to get him. I don't know, to me, it's just a, these are really, really fun movies. You guys know I always love going to Disney. And this, like, to me, I love the early Disney stuff. And this has some cool features on here. It has an interview with one of the guys who did... Um, the, you know, the music in the movie, uh, Walt Disney's daughter, as well as, you know, a sing-along feature, and a pretty cool thing on here when they go to Animal Kingdom and kind of take a tour of it behind the scenes. Always loved, you know, going to Animal Kingdom when I went to Florida, so it's kind of cool to see the behind the scenes of that. And then it has all the features that were on the old DVD edition of this. This is one, though, I would highly recommend. It also has a new alternate ending, which has never been, you know, before seen. But I would definitely check this one out. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have seen it, but it's definitely one I would recommend. The next one from Warner Brothers is one of my top favorite shows, you know, back from the days of TGIF. And it's Family Matters, the complete fourth season. And, you know, seeing shows like um, Boy Meets World coming back as Girl Meets World makes it be kind of cool if we saw this show uh, come back. And I kind of feel like that could happen. I don't know in what form and how they would do it. I don't know if Julia White would want to do it. But to me, it, there would be nothing cooler than at least seeing uh, like a night when they have a, you know, bring back TGIF and have step-by-step uh, -step brought back, um, you know, and uh, Full House brought back just for one episode, just for like kind of a reunion thing. But you guys haven't seen the show, you know, it's a show about Steve Urkel who lives next door and loves um, the the neighbors, you know, his next door neighbor, uh, Laura, he's always in love with her and always bothering her and, the, you know, her father, Carl Winslow, is always screaming at Steve and Steve's always getting into problems and causing issues. And this has a classic one on here when Steve and Carl go on uh, American Gladiators, which was really big at the time. So they brought that back a couple of years back. Um, but to me, though, this is just such a fun show. Highly would recommend it. You know, this is one of those things, too. If, if you guys, you know, I think they still play it on a couple of channels every so often now. But to me, it's one of my personal favorites. And so glad that, you know, Warner Brothers is just continuing to put out the seasons. Uh, hopefully down the line we see, like, Step by Step, which is another one that I really liked during the time. 
The next one from Warner Brothers as well, which I have only seen this once and watched this again for the first time in 10 years, and it's uh, Million Dollar Baby. It was the Clint Eastwood film. I only watched it once in theaters, though, because it's one of those movies that was so sad that it's kind of like really hard to watch just because if you know, you know, this, what, what about it is sad and things like that. But the story, though, was about, you know, Clint Eastwood's character who owns this boxing, um, you know, gym. And, you know, he used to be, he, he basically trains people, but everybody he kind of trains, he's always a kind of afraid of letting them commit and go further. He kind of holds them back doesn't want them to go any further and his um, Morgan Freeman works there with him he's his friend who's you know uses all of his money to track and kind of lives at the gym because he hasn't he can't handle having money and uh, Hillary Swank's character comes in and she's somebody who works in a you know kind of always sees herself as trash that's the way she calls herself she's like everyone always looks down at her and never thinks she's going to be able to do anything so she ends up wanting to be trained by Clint Eastwood to box to make something of herself and to kind of, you know, show everybody that she can do something because her family looks down on her. The, the people who play her family in the movie are horrible to her. Um, you know, and I forgot, too, that Jay Barchell is like one of his earliest movies. I totally forgot that he was in this film. Um, it's about, you know, Clint Eastwood training her. And, you know, he doesn't train women. And he's kind of all crudge mudgeon -y. And, you know, he's always great at playing that crudge mudgeon -y characters who's all upset and always upset at people. But this is just a really, really well done movie. Glad to watch this again. Like I said, I haven't seen this one since I saw it in theaters. But it's one of those ones that, to me, is kind of like Patch Adams, which is really, really sad. Has a bunch of features on here. Um, Million Dollar Baby, you know, featurettes on the film, talking to Hilary Swank and Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman, just and a commentary on here as well. But I would definitely check this one out if you guys haven't seen it. Just ordered because I wanted to watch it again, Boys Don't Cry, which I haven't seen in a long time. The next one from Fox is, um, you know, RoboCop, the unrated director's cut Blu-ray, which this version was only ever available on DVD before from Criterion. So I was really glad to see this one kind of, you know, come out. And there's also two versions of this. I believe the unrated, this version you can only get from uh, Best Buys. Um, but the other versions that they sell on Amazon and places like that are not the director's cut. So definitely, you know, get it from BestBuy.com or those places if you want to get the director's cut. So I would definitely recommend, you know, this movie is being remade now, which I'm, I'm going to see it. I'll definitely do a review of it. But, you know, the classic story of this is about a cop who gets killed and shot up and brought back as a robot and they believe that he they've erased his mind and it doesn't work he starts having glimmers you know the classic story about him getting the bad guys that killed him this is a you know one of those movies too that's ultra violent which makes it all the weirder to see the the new one PG-13 but to me this is one I would really recommend really love this movie and I also love the kind of the stuff when they were talking about the, the weird clips they always play with that guy going, I'll buy that for a dollar. I don't know. I just love this one. If you guys haven't seen this, definitely check this out. Like I said, this is the director's cut, which is only available, like I said, from, as far as I know, Best Buy. The next one from Anchor Bay is Scorned. And this movie is pretty much Billy Zane's character getting, you know, tortured terribly. Because Billy Zane's character in this movie is a guy who's cheating on his girlfriend. And the girlfriend is like nuts and real crazy about him. And um, and he's cheating on his girlfriend with the girlfriend's best friend. And the, the actress who's the lead in this is from the show, from, from the film Incision, which is a really, really cool one. I think Edgar Bay put that one out as well. But this is basically, she finds out, she sees a text on Billy Zane's character's phone that, you know, he's cheating with the girlfriend and that she's coming over and um and he basically ends up kidnapping you know tying them up and doing all this crazy stuff to torturing them pinching their fingers and vices and all kinds of torturous things and she's going crazier and crazier i like these kind of movies i thought she really pulls it off i thought to me this was one of the best Billy Zane films that I've seen in years. I thought Billy Zane was really good because a lot of movies that he's in lately are kind of really small parts or kind of silly or things like that. Like this, to me, was like really one of his best movies in such a long time. Really liked it. The director of this directed the first Leprechaun film. Um, I, th I heard, too, he's talking about doing a new one, which would be pretty cool if he did do that. I would definitely check this out. Like, if you like Billy Zane, too. Uh, you know, I will admit, though, Billy Zane, it's kind of funny how he doesn't really do Hollywood stuff. And just after Titanic, he kind of, 
you know, went away from all that, which I don't mind. I like the stuff he's done, but like I said, this is his best movie in a long time. Uh, the next one from Anchor Bay as well is the Dolph Lundgren film, uh, Battle of the Damned, which I really had a fun time with this. And it's about, uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of movies with a similar plot about a guy going into an area that was affected by a virus. And it's him going in, into an area affected by a virus by the people who accidentally let this virus out to get the guy's daughter who was there in the country. And I believe it was Bulgaria. Um, I watched another movie that had similar plots, so hopefully I'm not mixing up exact. No, this was in, uh, no, I'm mixing up the other movie. I knew I was going to do that. This is in Taiwan. I, th I think it was Taiwan. I, I'm pretty sure. I, I can't remember exactly, but there's some really cool martial arts kind of um, scenes where the people kind of um, choreographing of the people getting like attacked and things like that. But he ends up going into this place with a whole group of people to try and find the, the one guy's daughter. They all end up getting killed except the one. He just sort of leaves them there. He's like, ah, I can't do this mission. And leaves Dolph Lundgren's character there and goes back. And Dolph Lundgren's like, no, I'm going to complete this mission. And it's kind of him uh, looking for the girl and then finding her. And, and it's kind of this whole commune of people living there. And there's also an aspect in here with robots, which I really liked. And I thought the zombies in this one were really pretty cool. Like I said, too, they were really well choreographed attacks and things like that. Because you see some of these movies that are kind of poorly done. This one, like I said, to me, almost felt like, a, like the kind of vibe... Uh, Resident Evil, like the later Resident Evil films mixed with like Zombie 4 in the Philippines. I think that was the one in the Philippines. It, it had that kind of feel to it. And I don't know how to explain it, but really, like I said, I really was surprised with how much I liked this one, especially the robots aspect. But I don't want to get into how that comes into play, though. The next one from Anchor Bay as well is, is uh, Cutie in the Boxer, which is, I believe, up uh, for the best picture for documentary. And it's about this couple who... Um, you know, a Japanese couple who live in New York, and she met the guy who, when he was 40, I think 40, yeah, 40, and he, she was 19, uh, she, when she came to America, moved to America, met him, and he's a very famous um, artist for di basically doing these paintings where he boxes paint onto a canvas. He also makes these really cool bikes, these little bikes, paper mache bikes, and it's kind of the story about their life and about them planning to have this new opening and kind of about how he was really big in the 80s and in the 70s and how even in Japan to this day he can still sell his work so well. But in America, his stuff, people always go how much they love it, but it never sells. So it deals with a lot of stuff with him having to go back to Japan with these pieces in a suitcase and, you know, trying to make any money they can and all the years that they've been doing this and they still, you know, have to pay month by month and really haven't been making a lot of money doing this. I'm sure with this documentary that he's probably doing amazing now, I would think. Um, but it was a really well done, intimate documentary where it really gets close on them. There's some really emotional stuff with them and some footage of him years back. I really enjoyed this one. Like I said, it was one of those ones that really went into the lives and just got up close to them. It was just basically following them around. And his wife does these drawings, which are really cool drawings. Um, the next one from Magnolia. And this is one that I, I was, you know, I saw the trailer. I was really excited to see this. It's from the director of The Last King of Scotland. and was really, really good. I can never say her name, though, that... See, Rose Roan, I wish I could say the name right. I must need someone to, like, tell me once or twice, and then I'll know how to say it. But, you know, she was in The Host, um, Violet and, and Daisy, I believe, was the one. A bunch of stuff lately. She's always really good, though. Um, the movie's basically about her going to, um, you know, she's an American who's going to England to be with her cousins. And when she, you see when she's getting there, there's something weird. There's all kinds of police everywhere, and it kind of looks like it's set in a bit more of a futuristic time, because they're like scanning eyes and stuff like that. They never really get into exactly when the movie takes place, but when she's getting there, you see that there's all these people around, and like these police officers, and something's going on, and the woman who's, you know, who, her aunt who she's staying with is talking about, well, something could happen. And it's one of those movies, I don't know how much I can say, but it's kind of one of those movies that starts off really good when she gets there with her cousins and, you know, her meeting this guy, which I think was her cousin, which kind of made the relationship kind of odd, what was going on with them. But it was kind of them, I, I, unless I got some things confused, but it's about them meeting and things like that. But then something happens and things get really, really bad. 
and there's a separation they have to get back and I, I really love these kind of movies about things like this happening when bad events happen and having to get back and kind of the journey they have to go through was really exceptionally well done one of my favorite movies that in this update like I said though don't know how much I can talk about uh, just don't want to ruin anything about it but really really well done the next one from Cinedyme, and this is one, in my opinion, was the funniest thing I've seen in such a long time. And when it was over, I was like, every so often if I watch something, I'm like truly happy. You could clap. You like it that much. And to me, this was like watching a true 90s comedy that I really liked. And it would be a movie that I'll watch every so often quite a bit. It was that kind of a movie. And that doesn't happen much when I find something, when everybody is on point, in my opinion. You know, John Lovitz was kind of back to his old self you know, with his like kind of 90s comedy, the best I've seen him, uh, John Lovitz, I mean, John Lovitz, like I said, uh, Tom Arnold was great in it, but it stars Joe David Moore and Ivan Sergi, who was in the movie um, uh, Opposite of Sex and a bunch of different things, and Jennifer Love Hewitt, and it's Jutopia, and it's about this these two friends when they were in school, and the one friend, the one guy was uh, Christian, the one guy was Jewish, and it was kind of about... Um, they, they were kind of friends, and they kind of got separated because they were always causing problems. And in college, the one guy who wasn't Jewish meets this Jewish girl that he really likes. And right when they're graduating, he proposes to her, and she's like, oh, I can't marry you. You're not Jewish. And it's kind of about him. He has this thing in his mind that, you know, he likes being with Jewish women because they make all the decisions for him because he doesn't like making any decisions and can't figure out things for himself. This is years later. You know, after he ends up, you know, getting dumped by his girlfriend because he's not Jewish, he ends up at, you know, just for the hell of it, going to this synagogue, and there's this kind of kind of Jewish meet and greet thing going on for singles. He ends up meeting Jennifer Love Hewitt's character, and it's kind of he actually pretends to be Jewish and f ends up tracking down his old friend, played by Joe David Moore, you know, from the Hatchet film and a bunch of different stuff, uh, Grandma's Boy, and he kind of teaches him to be Jewish. And I don't know, it's just to me it was one of the funniest things. I there was, I don't know, I love this one so much. I, I would so recommend you guys check this out. Just some of these really funny sequences in this thing that happen. I absolutely, like I said, loved it. I thought everybody was great in it. And the next one, which I think is probably one of the most surreal films that I can say I've ever probably seen in my entire life, is Stitch. And I really liked it. It stars Eddie Furlong, uh, Shauna Waldron, who was the star of um, Little Giants. Everybody remembers that movie because I looked it up and knew I recognized her and that was what she was from. It's called Stitch. And it's about Eddie Furlong and his wife, you know, and their kid had just recently died. They go out to the middle of the desert to try and have this ceremony with their two friends um, to try and kind of forget, kind of a forgetting thing by doing this. And they, it's out in the, this weird house. But the thing about it is it makes it so weird is all the backgrounds are kind of like computer screensavers, uh, like these ultra-sharp, high-res backgrounds and, and it's like that the whole movie with the lightnings and the thunder and the effects it's like i don't know it's, what whatever it was made it feel like it was like in beetlejuice like when he went to the nether world it almost felt like that like the weirdest dreamlike thing i, I don't know this, i couldn't forget about this movie after i watched it and i and i tell you you have to look at this movie and you know they're, they're out there and after the ceremony they all wake up and they're like how did we get out here do, I, do you remember driving here? You know, the Dana, um, Diana Schallinger, you know, who played Simone in Pee Wee's Big Adventure is in the film, too. It's the woman who shows in the house. When they're out there, this house in the middle of the desert, they wake up, don't know what happened. The lightning storms start happening, you know, crazy outside the windows. They can't get away. And then things start happening, like people in the house start getting stitched up. These stitches drawn down their faces and their arms, and they're seeing all these crazy visions. Uh, the most surreal thing, we'll say the only thing about it that was kind of, a, you know, just a technical thing was like the, the makeup kind of changed positions a lot because I'm guessing they didn't take pictures, you know, of how they had it for continuity. So it kind of would change spots. But besides that, that was the only thing that was kind of weird, how it changed between take to take. But I, like I said, just such a surreal, odd, out there movie that was so different. You, you've not seen anything like it ever. But it, I loved it. I mean, I, I'm. It's one of those ones where after I watched it, I wanted to watch it again. So it just had this weird quality to it. 
Uh, the next one is, you know, All is Lost and I from Lionsgate. And I was kind of surprised, you know, that Robert Redford didn't get nominated for this. He got nominated for a Golden Globe for the movie. The movie, though, you know, it's essentially him out at sea and he ends up hitting the boat while he's asleep into this shipping crate that fell off of a ship and, you know, damaging the boat, putting a hole into the boat, and it kind of fries all the electronic devices like the radio and his computer and his phone. So he has no ability to call anybody about what happened and get help. And it's kind of about him, you know, the, the movie's basically, there's no dialogue at all with him talking, except like one little part. Um, but it's pretty much just showing him changing and that's kind of where all the, his, the acting was was showing how he starts out really calm and and is finding solutions and figuring out how to fix things and as things start to get worse and worse and how you know the emotion of him changing and I don't know I really enjoyed it but it is it's a movie that it's not like a, one of those movies where it's like uh like I said not no talking it's just pretty much about like a you know the dealing with what happened and how things continuously get worse and worse and him having to do this all by himself and then some really depressing things happen when you're kind of hoping for good things and it keeps going worse and worse and worse uh, it has a cool thing on here too a making of showing the um the sets and how they did all the stuff and all the stunt teams and everything behind you know doing the boat stuff the next one is the stallone you know um so that's just a long Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Escape Plan, which I enjoyed this movie a lot. Uh, this movie is basically about uh, Sylvester Stallone's character who's really good at escaping from jails. And he ends up getting this call to go to this ultra, you know, maximum security jail. Kind of reminded me of that movie Fortress, where he's like in this one, you know, it's like unescapable. And he gets there... And, you know, he has his code word to tell to the warden, you know, if he thinks that he can't do this. You know, and he, he notices things are very off. When he gets there, tells the warden the code word, and nothing's going on. Someone has basically put him away there. And it's him trying to figure out how to get out here. And he becomes friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger, his character, who's an inmate as well. It's them working together to try and get out of the jail. Um... I I I like really like both of them, especially Arnold Schwarzenegger though. He's like out of both of them, I always love him. And hopefully, he, at some point, he does another comedy. As I love those, you know, Junior and Kindergarten Cop and him in comedies. He's funny. Even that clip that he put up of him going to Gold's Gym, tricking people, even though everybody knew right away because all he was wearing was a bad fake mustache. I just love him doing comedies. Um, would definitely check this out, though, if you like those kind of escape movies. It's kind of like the Stallone movie, though, Lockdown. It's kind of like the same type movie, the same feel. The next one from Epic Pictures, which to me was the one I was talking about, which was one of the scariest things I've seen. I mean, I was truly terrified by some of this movie. Just some of these visuals and some of the stuff that was going on. I was, like I said, I was having some like sort of terrible dreams. So I was watching some of these movies right after each other. And this one especially creeped me out. You can't tell from the cover and the back. It doesn't really look as like it's going to be as scary of a movie as it is. And it's um, I Will Follow You Into the Dark uh, with M Mishka Barton, who did a really exceptionally good job in this movie. I think this movie could have gone theatrical. I, I really, you know, was good. It, to me, it had the feel, you know, when it comes to scary, of Session 9. Like, to me, Session 9 was one of the, in the recent years, one of the scariest things that I've seen. And this had that kind of feel to it. It's about Misha Barton, whose parents in the movie passed away uh, in the period of six months. You know, the mother died, and then right after the father died. So she's in a terrible state. She was kind of a religious person, or believed in afterlife and things like that. But her father says this real cryptic stuff to her about, oh, there's nothing out there. And, and it kind of changes her whole everything. And she's kind of depressed and living, you know, moves out. And just everything in her life is kind of... Not not perfect. And she ends up, you know, meeting this guy. He's basically just bumping him on the street, and they start talking. And then they kind of, kind of start seeing each other, but then she doesn't call him back, and then they start seeing each other again. And it's kind of about once they start seeing each other, he ends up one night 
uh, just vanishing from the apartment. And, you know, her and the roommates see, you know, the blood, but then they follow it up to upstairs, this, this uh, high-rise that he lives at, which is said to be haunted, and this really creepy stuff that they talk about happens on the top floor. And that's where the movie really picks up with her going up there and trying to find him. I will say it takes a little bit longer than I think it has to to get to that point. It's just a few minutes long, I think. That was the only thing I would say, but it really does kind of need all that, though, because it really is the build-up, because it is a love story between them, which makes what happens up there all the more. Work. But there's some visuals and things up there, especially this one old guy, which was, I, I don't know, like I said, it was truly terrifying stuff. I, I don't even want to talk about something. It was really, to me, it really worked. Watch this movie at night. Don't watch it during the day or something, you know, when the light's all coming, and you have to watch this at night to creep yourself out big time. Uh, like I said, it really worked. The next one from Paramount, and this is one that I don't think really had a rerun, you know, went into syndication much at all. And it's the spin-off series, which I believe went spun off why the original while the Witcher series was still going. And it's Joni Loves Trotsky, the complete first and second season, which I always wanted to see. This, I'll say, though, the best thing about the show is the opening theme song. There's something like, something about your streams. I, I love that kind of music. You know, especially like with those like microphones they have. And the, the movie, too, has kind of got a confusion with when it's set. And a lot of people online were talking about this as well. And that was one of the reasons I think it did last. It was Happy Days, you know, was set, I think, like in the 60s. 50s or 60s, and this kind of has, you know, supposed to be the 60s, but really feels like the late 70s during portions of the movie, during the show. It really kind of feels like even current to like 82 with kind of the music and some of the looks. Like they didn't have a great job, people, you know, picking out the look and stuff. But it's basically about joining Chachki, you know, Chachi. I'm, I keep saying Chachki, I don't know why I keep saying that, but, you know, moving in together. And, you know, the Fonz is in one episode of it. But it's them trying to get their music career going on. It's it's a fun show, though, but not perfect. And the show doesn't look that outstanding. I don't even know if there's really great masters of this available. I mean, they look okay. The second season looks better than the first. But I just I kind of feel like it's a show that didn't get aired very much. They kind of just have what they have of it. But I did hear, too, that they're going to be putting out the later seasons of Happy Days still because they've yet to put those out, and that I really love. The next one from Grand Entertainment is Chastity Bites, which is kind of like a Mean Girls-type film about this school when the parents' program is putting together this chastity program, bringing in this woman who's teaching the girls about and starting a chastity club, and she's basically a vampire. And all the girls that she brings into the club... Her goal is to, you know, bathe in their blood to stay young. And it's about um, the two girls at the school who are kind of like the the girls who aren't part of the popular club. The one girl kind of reminded me like of Daria in real life. So I kind of thought they could almost call this movie Daria the movie. And it, like this stuff happened in it. And it was about, you know, them... And the one girl starts to want to kind of get in this club because everyone cools in it, and she doesn't. The kind of girl who's like the Daria kind of character. And it's about her kind of trying to figure out what's going on and figure out what is with this woman and with this group and, you know, digging into the secrets. I think it was a pretty funny movie, though. Uh, not absolutely perfect, but I really did have a fun time with this. Like I said, if you like kind of Mean Girls movies mixed with that, it was one of those movies, though, that wasn't totally sure... I felt like what kind of a movie it was going to be if it was supposed to be kind of like the the language and the stuff like that was kind of more PG-13, but then the gore was more R-rated, so it was kind of kind of a mix of not totally sure I could tell with what rating and direction that they were going for this movie, and it doesn't even have a rating on it, though. Uh, the next one from E1, and this is the one that I was kind of mixing up with the other one. This is Cold Red, and this is in Bulgaria about... You know, during the time of the war, uh, World War Two, you know, the the Nazis had this kind of chemical compound that, you know, like an agent thing that was some kind of a, it's like a, I don't know what you would call it, like, does it say, like, nerve gas kind of thing that turns everybody into zombies. And the, the opening of this movie, the first 15 minutes, the World War Two footage was so well done. Like, they spent most of the budget in this sequence. Like, it was, like, exceptionally well shot. But it's, you know, about years later, and the nerve gas stuff ends up getting, like, they kind of 
find out about it. And this one soldier goes there to try and find it and see if it's there. And the, he gets these people there in, in Germany, get in, I think it was in Bulgaria, get wind of it and blow up the factory. And it ends up letting out this, you know, the gas and turning everyone into zombies. There's some pretty cool zombie stuff. There's also this, this scary old woman. It was, it was a guy in old women makeup. And it was like one of those scenes that I wound and watched it like five times over. And she was like at the, at the door and this girl walked by and said, That's right. Just keep on walking and ignore the old woman. It was like that, you know, as they say, cringe, real cringy, peculiar acting of this, this, this weird woman going, Oh, yes, what you out of here? No, not compound. But it was exactly how it was. But a weird, weird scene, but an interesting movie. The next one from Synapse is Real Zombies, which was a, is a movie about, um, it was actually made in 2008, so it's kind of, was made like, I think, a lot before these kind of movies. It was kind of like more like in the style of things, the Christopher Gus kind of things, instead of a found footage movie. And it's about making a documentary, you know, about making this zombie movie that takes place during a zombie outbreak. So the world, like half the population is gone. If you go outside, zombies are everywhere. But this director who's made these two zombie movies before wants to complete his trilogy. It's about him casting the movie, trying to find people, yet there's no one that's going to watch this movie because half the world's dead. There's like no internet or any of that kind of stuff going on anymore. And it's about him putting together this movie, you know, at the end of the world. I, I enjoyed this. It was kind of a fun, you know, like I said, that kind of a doc documentary style, not a found footage style as much as more, you know, documentary about showing the making of this movie and all the problems and people getting killed and how they have to figure out how to write them out because they turned into a zombie for real. And they also are using real zombies as the zombies in the movies. And they have this one cool guy who's trying to like, this cool old guy trying to figure out how to control them and putting these terrible like cheap leashes that he made. Kind of like him trying to copy it, you know, the Day of the Dead, the way they did it. But he's doing it with like cheap stuff. Uh, the next one from Kino from the art sportation films line, and this is one that was tr another tr terrifying movie, mainly for the visuals. I couldn't understand some of what was going on, but it's um, Memory of the Dead, and it's about, in the beginning of the movie, even the picture in the back are real creepy, but it's this um, this wo woman whose husband ends up dying in his sleep, and he's like, you know, she looks at him, he's like, you don't really know exactly what's happened, and she's, you know, a number of months later, she's with the friends of the guy who died, you know, all of her friends who were good friends with him, and they're planning to have this thing where they have a ceremony or, you know, all kind of get together in hopes of him coming back from the dead. And when they're there doing this, all these weird things start happening, and they all start seeing these terrifying, crazy images of things outside, and these things with, like, these weird faces pulling out eyeballs, and you know, all the people from their past who have died this night, um, you know, come back. It kind of has like an evil dead feel, but like everyone in their lives who have died come back and torture them. I don't know. I, I really like this one. Like I said, it's a really, really creepy, weird stuff in it. The next one is kind of like the, I uh, don't want to say too much, but I don't want to ruin too much about it, but it's um, antisocial. A lot of people have been talking about this one, and it's about... In the world, you know, you know, everybody's on things like Facebook and things like that. And I don't know how much I can say about this, but basically something is going on. And people in the world are getting affected by, you know, when they see them on their electronics devices, you see these kind of things coming out at them and kind of turning them crazy and like into basically zombies. And it's about them, you know, everyone in the world is you know, is on the computer getting affected by this and going absolutely crazy. So in the beginning, these two girls shooting a web video, getting killed, you know, the one killing the other one. And you just see all these weird things. And it's about this girl who goes over to a friend's house and they all have to barricade themselves in there while the zombies are taking over outside. And little by little, it starts affecting them. And it's just kind of these crazy things are happening to them. Really enjoyed it because it's a very you know, modern movie that really deals with things like Facebook and kind of takes a really creative, different turn to these kind of things. And like I said, I don't want to get into too many details about exactly what it is and what's going on, but I like this one. Like I said, it was a very different movie. Uh, the next one from Image is The Invoking. This is a movie about this girl who got this letter that 
she had this house. A lot of people say the idea sounds a little bit like uh, the Texas Chainsaw, you know, the new one, 3D. I guess it was sort of like that, but that was it wasn't exactly. But these friends kind of get together at this house, and, you know, the thing is, the, the house on the cover makes it look like it's a different house, but it's more like just like a kind of a country small house. And they end up getting to this house, and the guy who, you know, is, is there to try and show them around the place, and he's t talking to the girl who inherited this house and saying, oh, do you remember when we did this? And remember when this happened? And he really remembers her. And she doesn't remember any of this stuff because she, when she was five, she ended up getting taken away from, the, from her parents. But the guy's telling her all these crazy things and she doesn't understand it or remember any of it. And things start happening in this house. Weird things. People start almost getting, like, possessed and, like, saying all this crazy stuff. The one girl is, like, saying all these religious things. It's kind of, that's mainly what it is the guy who's showing off the house though did a really good performance in this movie and also has which you don't see on too many indie indie horror movies a documentary that's an hour and like 25 minutes long of making it which was pretty cool to see that long of a documentary on the movie uh the next one is um laughing to the bank this is from image as well the brian hooks film this is kind of like a spoof on him himself it's about him it starts off with him in this like garage getting um to these two kind of mobsters yelling at him, going, where's the money? What'd you do with the money? You know, give us the money. And he's kind of telling them the story of what happened and about him trying to pitch his TV show. Like I said, it's kind of a spoof on him because he's, you know, an actor who's been in things like Soul Plane, Fool's Gold, uh, a bunch of different movies, you know, High School High. And, you know, he's pitching the, the movie to, like, the executives, and it kind of shows scenes, um, like, kind of skits. And they're kind of pretty funny skits, um... That's pretty much what it is, like skits and then the friends trying to put together the show. And there's a lot of stuff, too, in Vegas, when you know, when they get there. and I, I thought it was a pretty funny thing. I, I thought some of the skits, though, kind of slowed down, but there was some stuff in Vegas that slowed down the story a little bit. But in Vegas, there was some re there's one scene when there's this fight scene, and I guess they just kind of almost seemed like they found random people. They were just around, and there were some weird people in the background, like just some random people. that you only saw them, like, once or twice. It was like, oh. Oh, like, I don't know. It's like, I don't know where these people came from. It just, to me, that one thing I took away from it, remembering the most, was like the weird people and that, like the weird extras and stuff in it. I enjoyed it, though. Like, I'm a fan of Brian Hooks, and I thought it was a pretty fun, you know, movie about him making this, trying to make this show and, you know, getting the money and what ends up happening to it when he does and, you know, the mobsters who are trying to find out about what happened. Uh, the next one from the image as well is the Adventure, Adventurer, I think that's how you say it, The Curse of the Midas Box, and it stars um, uh, Sam Neill. It's about this, you know, the the Midas Box, you know, like who has the Midas Touch, you know. If you put anything in this box, it ends up turning into gold, and this guy and his family ends up getting taken away because this guy comes and says, I found this thing, uh, the Midas Box. I was kind of getting a little confused with some of the stuff. She says he found it, and the parents end up getting taken away by Sam Neill's character, and he ends up escaping with his younger brother. And it's these people who are from Sam Neill are coming after him, and this guy who's helping them. And there's these scenes of them going to a hotel, and trying to, because that's where they believe that the box is. So it's kind of an adventure kind of film. Kind of reminds me of the new Sherlock Holmes films. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. I, I have a feeling that it's going to be one of those movies that they they want to do as kind of like a series. It, that's kind of the kind of feel it did. I don't believe that there was ever one before of this, but it has that kind of feel. Like, I don't know if it was based on a book or anything like that, but it definitely has that kind of vibe to it. I liked it, though. Like I said, it's kind of like a young Sherlock Holmes kind of feeling movie. And the last one from uh, Mill Creek, and this was pretty cool. This is finally on DVD. This is the Three Stooges 6 movie set, which has Have Rocket Will Travel, which was one of my favorite of those Three Stooges movies with Curly Joe in it. Uh, the Outlaws Coming, Rockin' in the Rockies, Three Stooges Go Around the World, Three Stooges Meet Hercules, Time Out for Rhythm. But like I said, my favorite was the Have Rocket one when they find this rocket. Uh, there's some really weird stuff. And I remember, too, like they sh do a, sh a shot of Disneyland from above. I believe in that, that I always kind of liked that they, because Disneyland was kind of new at this point. Um, like I said, though, this is a really cool set, and these have not been released before. I think some of them might have come to DVD, but Rocket One, I know, has not come out before. Um, but anyway, though, that's all for this DVD Blu-ray uh, update. Like I said, definitely give this video a thumbs up, and I'll see you guys later.